Hello, and uh, welcome to Read the Rules, What Technical Writers Can Learn from Board Game Design. My name is Matthew Baldwin. I am a content developer at Microsoft, uh, and I'm also a lifelong enthusiast of tabletop board games. And those two fun facts about me are not unrelated. In 2006, I applied for a job at Microsoft. Uh, the position title was Programmer Writer. And I figured, well, I'm a programmer, and I was. I was a programmer at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center at the time. And I also fancied myself a writer in the sense that I had written short stories. I had a blog as required by law in 2006. Uh, I had written for some other side projects. So by my way of thinking, programmer, writer, sure, programmer, writer position, perfect for me. Did the interview. Uh, interview went well, but at the end of it, they asked me if I had any writing samples that I could send to them to, as examples of my ability to write programmer, writer content. Well, that evening I went through my portfolio, such as it was, to find the closest approximation to technical writing that I could find. And what I finally wound up sending them was several sets of board game rules that I had written in the capacity of a freelance game designer for a local game company. Looking them over, it seemed to me that uh, it was basically procedural guidance in much the same way that uh, API technical writing was procedural guidance. and you know, maybe they would accept this as uh, a passable example of technical writing. Well, apparently that gambit worked because they did hire me. Uh, I'll be celebrating my 15th year at Microsoft next year. Uh, and in that time I've been with Microsoft, I have only become more convinced that board game rule writing and technical writing uh, are very similar. In fact, I tend to think of board game rules as the quintessential technical writing. When you think about it, when you're writing rules for a board game, you really only have one chance to get it right. It's kind of a high stakes operation. Once you put those rules into the box and ship it out, there's really no opportunity to ship a patch or make corrections. Uh, people are gonna pull out those rules and that's all they have to go on. Um, also, you can't, deduce anything from a board game if there's some rule that is unclear or there is a, a rule that's omitted. It's not like if you buy a gadget and you can play around with the buttons and you can tap the icons and, you know, eventually you can actually figure out what it is that you're trying to figure out. But with a board game, if a rule is missing, honestly, you'll have no idea that that rule was missing until such time as the game doesn't work. And that is because unlike a gadget or unlike software, Board games are, the the board game is not in the physical part of it. When you open a box uh, and you take the rules out of the box, everything that's left in the box is not the game. The board is not the game. The card is not the game. The components are not the game. The game is the rules. Uh, when you play a board game, you're basically executing a set of algorithms that are codified in the rule book. In that sense, the board game rules are very similar to a software program. It's a series of steps that it goes through. And the platform on which board game rules run are the people playing the game. It's essentially the original self-documenting code. Uh, and when you look at it in that respect, then it becomes very obvious how the person writing board game rules is, in a sense, functioning as a technical writer, the quintessential technical writer. And I would go further and say, by learning the principles behind a good rule book, the base, the best practices they use, the information architecture that they use, you can actually learn a lot about the trade of technical writing. And there's lots of great ideas in there to steal, if you're a professional technical writer, uh, steal those ideas and apply them to your own trade. And so, hence the my talk uh, about learning those principles for technical writers. Uh, this talk is roughly divided into two halves. Uh, the first half is going to be about information architecture. The second half is going to be kind of a laundry list of best practices. For the first half, I'm going to be focusing heavily on this game, Wingspan. This game is kind of a big deal in the board game community. It came out in 2019. 
Everybody seems to love it, won a bunch of awards, got a profile in the New York Times, made everybody really excited. Uh, that's my first board game recommendation uh, of this video. Uh, but more to the point, I want to talk about uh, the board game rules that come with the game. This is the rule book. This is actually an accompanying book that comes with it called the Appendix. Uh, they've chosen to divide the, the rules up into a main how to play guide and then an appendix that gives you more specific information. This is sort of our first step into the information architecture of modern board game rule books. All right, back to the slides. And as you uh, have probably deduced from the birds and the food and the eggs and the boxes as wingspan, this uh, image of my title slide is in fact wingspan. All right, let's talk about the information architecture of that rule book. We already sort of talked about the first uh, element of that is that they actually broke part of it out into an appendix. The main rules, as you read it, you'll notice that they have a very methodical way of rolling out the information to you. The way they do that is they start by giving you a very high level view of how the game works uh, and what the players are doing. Then they go to sort of a medium level view of how a particular turn works and how rounds work. And only then do they get down to the nitty gritty of giving you the specifics of what the various things you can do on your turn, how that, how those actually play out, uh, and how cards work, and so on and so forth. Uh, that principle is they teach you from the general to the specific. So the first thing they start with is the big picture, and this is pretty common for board games. Right there on the uh, first page of the rule book, usually before they get into anything, even including setup, they uh, give you a very brief description of the game. This one says, you are bird enthusiasts seeking to discover and attract the best birds to your network of wildlife preserves. Each bird extends a chain of powerful combinations in one of your habitats. Each habitat focuses on a key aspect of the growth of your preserves. Gain food tokens via custom dice in a bird feeder dice tower. Lay eggs using marbled egg miniatures in a variety of colors. Expand your bird collection, drawing from hundreds of unique bird cards. The winner is the player with the most points accumulated from birds, bonus cards, end of round goals, eggs, cash food, and tucked birds. Almost every game has one of these little intro paragraphs. A lot of times uh, people will skip them because they go, well, it's, it's, just, it's just the theme of the game. It's just flavor text. It's really not that important to learning it. But really, when you think about it, if you review this paragraph, we've learned a lot about this game just in these few words. What have we learned? Well, we know it's a game about birds. We know that we, the players, are not the birds. You're not playing as a bird. You're playing as a collector of birds. Um, we know that there is food involved some way. We know that there's eggs involved. We know that you can collect bird cards, and then you can use those cards to create powerful combinations, it says. And perhaps most importantly, we know roughly how the game is won. The game is won by accumulating points. And it even lists the sources where you can get those points from. Birds, cards, goals, eggs, so on and so forth. Uh, and so, for example, we know this isn't going to be a race game like Candyland where you're trying to get to the end of a track. Um, so really, this, uh, this sort of filler text or theme text or flavor text uh, provides a conceptual framework to the reader of these rule books uh, so to help them understand everything that comes after it. Uh, as they go through um, turns or rounds or the other details, they know that they should be focused on this goal of how do I how do I get points? Now, this idea of keeping in mind what the customer is trying to do at Microsoft, in my org, we refer to this as the customer intent. What is the customer trying to do? The customer or is a player in Wingspan, and that that player is going to be trying to. Uh, accumulate points. And so everything is written to guide the customer towards that thing that they're attempting to do. Um, and in that sense, my org likes to write what we refer to as customer-focused documentation. Documentation where uh, every sentence and every paragraph we write is focused on getting that customer to the goal um, that they seek. After this big picture, Rule books then go to an overview. So 
in Wingspan, you have two short sections of overview. There's this one, which gives you the turn structure, what you as a player will be doing on a particular turn. Uh, you learn here that on a turn you have four choices, of which you can choose one. Uh, play a bird, gain food, lay eggs, or uh, draw bird cards from the deck. Um, after they give you this very high level uh, overview of a turn, they talk about how the turns are grouped into rounds and what happens at the end of each round. And then, again, they give you the scoring. So again, there's that focus on uh, the goal, the customer intent. Um, between the big picture and the overview, you now have both a conceptual framework for everything you're going to learn going forward. You also now have a structural framework. Um, you know how the game is organized. Not just the rules are organized, but how the actual game is going to be organized. So now when we get to the next section, the details, everything should fit into the spots you've sort of allocated in your, your brain for how this game is going to work. Now the way I describe this by analogy, it's like doing a jigsaw puzzle. Um, if you've done any number of jigsaw puzzles, you may have learned that one of the easiest ways to do jigsaw puzzles is first to identify the edge pieces, assemble the edge pieces, uh, and then now whenever you grab a piece that you haven't yet put in the puzzle, you know the rough boundaries of where that piece has to go. That's the same objective that uh, these rule books are doing. They give you the bounds. And it's the same objective that your technical writing should do uh, as well. You start out, give folks the boundaries of what that article is going to cover. Uh, and then as they go through your article, uh, it'll be, become apparent when you provide the details where those individual details go. And sure enough, the next thing we find in the wingspan rulebook are the details. So here we have a page for each of those aforementioned uh, actions. So there's the play a bird card from your hand, there's the gain food, there's the lay eggs, and there is the draw more bird cards. Um, and then finally, there's a brief page on the various bird powers. Every bird in this game has a power written on it that uh, activates at various points during the game. And then it uh, gives you the specific details about the end of the round. And once again, there's some more details here about uh, scoring. So these three, uh, these fill in all the details of that framework that you have been provided uh, before. By the way, take a look at this, uh, how this is laid out and how is easy it is to scan these pages. There's images, there are headers, um, by virtue of breaking things down into uh, the various sections, like the turns and the rounds, if you're playing the game and uh, you actually have a question or you've forgotten how to do something, just look how easy it would be to find that specific thing uh, in this rulebook. That's a principle that we refer to as scannability uh, at Microsoft, and it's something we value pretty highly. Also note there's like white space, and there are some extraneous notes on here, but they're set off in this purple so that it's clear to the reader that this isn't something that's part of the main text and that they can ignore it if, if they would like. Finally, um, now we're going to get to that second book that I pulled out of the Wingspan box that was called the Appendix. The Appendix is basically the reference. So as I mentioned before, every card in Wingspan has some sort of power associated with it. They do not go through all of those powers in the main book. What they do is they set them off into a reference book, which they call the appendix. And so if, as you're playing the game, you come across a card, and for some reason you don't quite understand what it's supposed to do, or maybe there's some combination with another card that doesn't leap out at you, you can pull out this appendix and refer to this. We do the same thing uh, in my group as far as the technical documentation. We have our references set apart from our... Uh, conceptual documentation. Uh, again, the idea is you read the conceptual documentation. We we talk about the various things you can do uh, as far as like uh, REST API calls and what they do. But if you have a real specific question, we're not going to like fill up that page with all the reference and make what should be you know an article you can read in five minutes, an article you read in forty minutes. Instead, we set that off into its own book, as it were, uh, and make sure that people can easily find that reference if they need it. Ideally, here in Wingspan, all the cards are going to be intuitive enough. You don't need to refer to this appendix, but just in case, you have it there so there's nothing to impede the player's enjoyment of the game. 
So that's kind of a breakdown of the information architecture. As I said, I used Wingspan as an example, but uh, most modern uh, board games, at least the ones that are, have well-written rule books, follow, do something similar. Uh, they teach in the general specific. They break things up. For the rest of this presentation, I'm going to look at a variety of rule books and just call out some things that I've always noticed as best practices. Uh, and in every case, I think that um, these best practices can, if not be appropriated and integrated into your technical documentation, uh, I at least think that they're interesting to think about as you write because they can inform the choices you make. So first best practice, remember that people learn by doing. Wingspan comes with two books, a rule book and an appendix. Uh, many games these days will have three books in the box. They'll have a rule book, they'll have a reference book, and they'll have a how to play guide. In fact, more and more what I am seeing is that instead of having any rule book, uh, games will just come with a how to play guide and a reference. This is the setup page for a game called Marvel Champions, um, based on the, the Marvel superheroes. Um, and you can see there's this step-by-step -step, um, way to set up the game. But the underlying assumption on this page is not that you're just reading this, you know, you're in bed at night before you go to sleep and you're reading this with the thought of playing this game tomorrow or you're, you know, you're preparing for a game night next week, but you're actually going to go through these steps. Step one is select your hero. And... What they want you to be doing is they want you to physically open the box, pull out the heroes, choose the ones you want. Step two, you set a dial. So there's these uh, dials that come with the game and you physically set it uh, to the number that it's supposed to be at. People learn different ways. Some people learn by hearing. Some people learn by reading. Some people learn by doing. Um, by giving the information in two channels here, they're reading it and they're also doing it as they as they uh, are going through these steps, you have a much better chance of them retaining that information. Uh, where I work, uh, we have what are called quick starts. They're Azure quick starts. That's the documentation that I specifically work on. Uh, they're short, they're concise, and the expectation is that the reader of those quick starts is going to be going through those steps uh, as we uh, go through them. Now, it's not going to be pulling dials out of boxes and setting them, but in the example of, say, a quick start around using the Azure CLI, we provide the commands and we hope that they are actually going to type those commands in themselves into our CLI. Or we have a little interactive window that they can use to put those commands in there. At the very least, we hope they copy them and paste them in somewhere because we know that by doing that, they're going to retain that information better. And the added benefit is that people like doing things. It it's very rewarding. You get that little burst of endorphins when you've accomplished something. So our hope is by the time someone gets through one of our quick starts, they not only remember how to do it, but they uh, they realize how easy it is and they want to do more. The next principle I want to call out is, or is call things what they are. This is the one counter example I'm going to use in this presentation of a bad best practice. This is from a 1964 game called Waterloo. Uh, and what you'll notice is in the map board, they have this line, a hexagonal grid has been printed on the board and it is used to determine movement. Hereafter, these hexagons will be called squares. Here's another example. This is actually from a game I quite enjoy. Uh, it's a little less egregious than hexagons will be called squares, but still. Uh, this is a game called Mystery Rummy. And they do this thing where they call the draw deck, because this is Rummy, right? If you're familiar with Rummy, there's a deck of cards, you draw a card, you play cards. But they don't call it the draw deck. They decide to call the draw deck the case file. And they decide to call the discard pile Scotland Yard. That's cute. It's thematic. I don't know how thematic you really need to be for a game that's basically Rummy. But it's, it's a neat idea. But in practice you're going to forget what the case file is and what Scotland Yard, especially if you play this game once and you come back to it in three months and you draw a card and it says, okay, you can go through the case file and take the card of your choice. Now you got to go back to the rule book. Um, so just call things what they are. In technical writing, we kind of have a bad habit of uh, falling into sort of branded terms or lingo or jargon. Um, just use clear language 
use the use words that your customer is going to recognize and that they use themselves and it'll just make everything uh, so much easier to use an example from my documentation set um, i work on uh, azure disk encryption which interacts with the virtual machines we in our documentation we had um, what we called ephemeral disks everybody calls these temporary disks we like the name ephemeral disks we had this idea that that was a little more uh, accurate probably just because it sounds fancier and one day we just decided that you know what we should just be calling these all temporary disks through and through and we changed every instance of temporary di uh, of ephemeral disk to temporary disk and it, you know obviously in retrospect it was the obvious thing to do that leads me to my next uh, best practice from rule books define your terms and use them exclusively um, this is an example from a game called gloomhaven you can see that what they do is they have these uh, terms as bolded items. They talk about an action. Uh, on the cards, there is a top action and a bottom action. This is pretty common in rule books these days to bold a specific term the first time you see it, um, and then maybe provide a little definition for it, and then always use that term in the exact same sense. If you refer to a hand of cards, and that hand of cards means the cards you're physically holding, but excludes cards that are on the table in front of you. That's what a hand of cards should mean every single time you use it. And, and vice versa, whenever you refer to a hand of cards, that should be the phrasing you use, a hand of cards. Just like we decided in every case, we are going to refer to uh, ephemeral disks as temporary disks. Not only uh, does this make your prose a lot more readable, um, but it actually it saves a lot on localization as well, right? Because they don't have to translate four terms where only uh, one will use. And also you don't have this situation where somebody comes across a passage around, uh, say, ephemeral disks and another passage around temporary disks and uh, have to wonder whether you're talking about the same thing or not. Some rule books have go gone so far as to use icons whenever they refer to something specific. This is from Terraforming Mars. This is almost like a glossary where they're defining these specific terms. This is steel, this is titanium, this is plants. And then also on the cards, wherever you, rep wherever you find these terms, you also will find the corresponding symbol. Again, great for localization because if you have a card with these symbols on it, uh, they don't have to be translated. But even more so than that, it just means that uh, there's never any ambiguity about what steel means. If you have a question, you can go to this page, you can see it. This almost functions as a glossary and uh, you can get on your way. All right, next best practice, add images. Following from uh, my previous one where they're using these icons to represent very concepts, images just in general um, greatly enhance the readability of a documentation and in some specific cases can make a part of that documentation uh, much better. The classic example in board game rules is the setup. You could have the setup as just a list of items in a bulleted list and sort of describe where the, this deck of cards is supposed to go. It's supposed to go in the upper left or you're supposed to uh, put these in these various locations. But you use uh, an image in this particular instance and this is just like paint by the numbers. You pick up these uh, cure markers, you put them in this box. This, by the way, is from a game called Pandemic. Topical uh, came out, I think, 15 years ago, so it's not capitalizing on anything. Fantastic game. Um, this image is uh, invaluable to setting up the game. Now, I think as technical writers, we all know that overuse of images can, uh, you, the pendulum can swing too far. Uh, if you overuse screenshots, uh, those screenshots have to be revised all the time. UIs go out of date. Um, if somebody is scanning an article and all they get is a couple of sentences between each, each image, uh, you know, it can be hard to parse that, but uh, just adding even a single image to an article uh, just makes it much more attractive. And in a case like the setup in a game or maybe some uh, system architecture in some technical documentation uh, can save you the proverbial thousand words. Be generous with examples. This is from a game called Splendor. Um, this is a sh easy game, pretty easy game. It's a, a family game. It's one of our favorites. I think the rule books are like four pages. Even with only four pages of rules, they still make a point of including examples whenever they talk about something. Here on the left, we talk about development cards. 
um, and they provide in yellow a specific example of how those development cards uh, are used and how they are purchased. Here on the right, we have noble tiles, and it's followed immediately by an example of how you can gain those noble tiles. In technical writing, uh, that could be code samples. It could be giving uh, specific uh, use cases where somebody is using your technology, or if you're talking about a specific set, uh, step in the process of doing something, it's zeroing in on how a specific person uh, could go about doing that. Um, I'm one of those people who mostly goes by examples. I'm an old school programmer. I uh, used to program on Unix. Well, I still I still do Unix shell stuff. And there's nothing I hate more than going to a man page um, and finding 800 or 1,000 or 2,000 words describing exhaustively every single possible use of some command with zero example. Just give me the example so I can copy and paste it into my own terminal and see what it does. That's what I want as a reader. That's probably what your readers want as well. Point out frequently overlooked steps. This is something that some uh, board game rule books do. Uh, not a lot, but whenever they do it, I find it extremely useful. This is from uh, a game called Battlestar Galactica. At the end of the rule book, it's just a very quick summary of these are the various rules that, for one reason or another, people just doesn't stick in people's minds that we discovered through playtesting that people often forgot. Uh, before a game uh, goes out the door, it's playtested hundreds of times. Uh, so those people should have a good idea of which of those rules um, just get overlooked. Again, in technical documentation, um, as you as you go through these articles, you know, we know the, the support calls that come in about the same thing. And you might say, We've got documentation that covers that. We say right here that you're supposed to set this flag or you're supposed to click this button in the UI. If you're getting support calls about that uh, a lot, uh, probably stands to rewrite that section of your article. But also, there's no shame in just making a point of, of saying, hey, by the way, you might have missed this above, but you're going to need to set this flag. Um, sometimes we do this in the form of uh, FAQs after the fact to address those frequently asked questions. Um, or you can just put something in bold or in otherwise call out a specific uh, a thing that you think that just should you should draw people's attention to a second time. Flag what's new. Earlier this year, this game came out called Clank Legacy. This is a new version of an older and very popular game called Clank. Uh, 80% of the DNA of this game is the same as the older Clank. If you already know how to play Clank, learning Clank Legacy is a snap. Except, you actually, if you already know the rules to Clank, there's you know, one disadvantage, and that is you come into these rules with some assumptions, and those assumptions uh, might thwart you. For example, if in Clank you discard your hand at the end of your turn, and in Clank Legacy you don't, you might get that rule wrong. The way they address that, as you can see down here at the bottom, they say, if you have played the original Clank, uh, look for this symbol on the bottom of some pages. It highlights key rules differences from that game. Um, similarly, in our technical documentation, uh, our, every article that we publish on Docs has a date on the top to signify the last time that major revisions were made to that article. But we don't really expect people to walk around and store the date of an article in their head and then the next time they go to that article do a mental comparison and then go through that document to try to suss out what we change. We try to accompany uh, a lot of our changes with release notes or what's new saves them all that trouble. They can just quickly see what's changed. They uh, they already have again like 90% of the knowledge in their heads. They can just learn that 10% saves everybody a lot of time. Use a consistent layout. Um, there's a board game company called Alia. They're in Germany. They were making games. They've been making games for, I don't know, 20 years. They were one of the first ones to make really quality um, family games. These are three of the Alia rule books. Uh, on the left is Castles of Burgundy. In the middle is Vegas. And here on the right is La Isla. Looking at these and setting aside the color scheme, you might very well think that these are three pages of a single uh, rule book. And you would think that because there is a very consistent way that they do their rules. They have headers, so for scannability, they all have this uh, sidebar on the right side which gives examples and uh, highlights the most important points. Um, 
And if you've played one Aaliyah game and you pick up a brand new Aaliyah game and you open that rule book, like you're halfway to learning the game because you don't have to then figure out how they've chosen to organize their content. Aaliyah does it the same way across the board. The analogy here in technical writing is use templates for your articles. Uh, make sure that if people are jumping from one article to another, they don't have to like figure out, well, why is this article using headings in a different way that this article is using headings? Um, why is this one putting the, uh, the goal of this uh, piece of information at the bottom of the page instead of the top of the page? Templatizing stuff is a great way of um, getting this sort of standardization, and it makes it easier to write because instead of sitting down and writing everything from scratch, you already have the framework to slot your own stuff in. It's kind of the, the back-end side of the way that the rules were explained, right? Start with the structure, fill in the details. Play to your audience. All the examples I've given so far, with the exception of Waterloo, have been from family games. Um, you know, from like pretty easy to moderate complexity. Um, but not every, those are not the only kinds of gamers. This is a set of rules from a game called Twilight Struggle, which is a essentially a war game set in the Cold War. And because it is a war game, it's written in a way that war gamers will appreciate. All of the major sections are numbered. When they refer to other sections, they refer to them by number. Uh, the, it uses a versioning like 3.0, 3.1, 3.2, and then goes into A, B, C. I would never, ever use this uh, type of rule book in a family game or even a strategy game. But if you were to write the Twilight Struggle rules any other way, war gamers would complain. So address it uh, to your audience. Conversely, this is a page from a role-playing game. It's called Good Society, the Jane Austen role-playing game. And this is one of many, many, many pages um, describing how the game is played. And you can see it is a big block of text. It's very informal. It's not being super rigorous with its terms. But for one thing, these are role-players. Role-players are accustomed to reading a lot uh, when they are learning a game. And more to the point, these are Jane Austen fans. They like reading. I mean, it it's, comes with the territory. So if you're writing for Jane Austen fans, feel free to be more verbose than you would be otherwise. Make it accessible. These are the cards from a game called The Crew. Um, as you can see, it says, if you cannot easily distinguish between the colors of the cards, you can use these four symbols instead. Here on the right, I've actually put an image of those cards. It's a trick-taking game with four suits. It's you got to know what the suit is when you play a card, as in all tricking taking games. Uh, the suits are colored, but you can see they all have these uh, icons as well. If the crew can go through all this effort to make their game accessible to people with uh, color blindness, then you can fill out the alt tags in your images. Just really uh, no excuse uh, for doing that. On a similar note, uh, one of the things you'll notice about Wingspan as you read through that book is that there are no gender pronouns in that rule book at all because it's written in second person. It says, you do this, you do that. Um, again, the, it's this whole point of accessibility and inclusivity. Um, write things in second person. You just don't even need to have those, uh, those gendered pronouns in the first place. And the last thing that, uh, the last best practice I want to cover when you ship your, uh, before you ship your rule book is put it to the test. Um, the people who design the games, game designers, they have the whole game in their head. It started in their head. They wrote it down. They put it into, uh, into components and into rules. Um, they know it so well that they are the worst person to write those rules because it's very easy for them to just say, some things in this game are so obvious, I don't need to write it. They don't make a conscious decision to omit it, but it can get omitted. Um, so what game designers do or game companies do, the last thing they do before they ship a game is they have what is called a blind play test. And that is you get people together to play test the game, but you don't explain the game to them. You just give them the rule book, let them figure it out themselves. There's no quicker way to discover where uh, you've gone wrong in your rules than to have people learn it from the rule book. Likewise, I think one of the greatest um, value adds that a technical writer can give to a um, to developers or PMs, if they write the first uh, draft of documentation, 
do that blind taste test. Go through what they've written step by step. You come to the table with none of the knowledge they have, none of the assumptions they have. You're going to spot the places where your customer is going to get caught and you'll fix them before they go out uh, the door. One last thing I want to add. Um, I joked before that after you write board game rules, you can't just ship a patch. But earlier this year, uh, there a new game came out called Tapestry. And it had this new thing where it, the rulebook encouraged players, whenever they played a game of Tapestry, to go to the website, log how many people played the game, and Tapestry is a civilization game where people have various types of civilization. One player might be isolationists, and one might be futurists, and one might be technologists. So you log how many people played, and you log what civilization you played with, and submit that to the company. This is a graph that they compiled of all the data they collected from players self-reporting how their games went and who won. And within a month or two, of this, they realized that some of the civilizations were underpowered and other civilizations were overpowered, and they essentially patched the game. They released this, the civilization's adjustments, where uh, some of the civilizations that were consistently lo losing, they made them a little stronger. Some of the civilizations that were consistently winning, they brought them down uh, a little bit. Same thing with your technical documentation. If you're not monitoring the feedback you get, you're not monitoring the verbatims, you're not talking to support people and finding out um, you know, where, where the people are, take that data. It is invaluable. Where I work at Developer Relations, we pride ourselves on being a data-driven organization. Uh, this, what the, what the developer of uh, Tapestry has done is the same sort of thing that we pride ourselves on doing. Keeping an eye on those metrics, making changes to make sure that the experience for the customer is as good as it possibly can. That was my uh, best practices. Getting a little hoarse, probably good that this is wrapping up. Uh, I did promise some recommendations. Um, so every game with the exception of Waterloo that I talked about uh, in this presentation, I would recommend to you. Uh, I've got a list of them all here. If you wanna see this slide deck and you want to see additional recommendations, uh, you can go to my website. It's defectiveyeti.com slash WTD. Uh, again, I'll have this deck and I'll have uh, all the board game recommendations uh, you could possibly want. My understanding also is that there's going to be a Q&A session to follow this if I haven't run too long. So feel free to put me on uh, the spot there. Thank you very much for allowing me to talk about my favorite subject for 30 minutes or possibly longer. And I, I hope you found this useful. Wow, lots of people are very excited about your talk, lots of board game enthusiasts. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> like, just to say the very least, uh, I think I'll go ahead and get into some of the questions. Um, sure. We had an early question from Andrea Morales about uh, how games have goals. And in that context, the goal is usually to win the game. But in the case of real life products, the goal is not always as clear. So Andrea is wondering, uh, do you divide documentation by customer intent? Well, the goal in board game rules, I mean, there's, you're trying to teach people how to play the game. And of course, implicit in that is that you're, the people playing the game want to win the game. But really the goal in the rules is to teach them how to play the game. Um, and it's a very subtle distinction between the two, but uh, it's sort of important that um, you know, to, to give a concrete example, one thing you do not see in board game rules a lot of is strategy. It could be really, you know, if you're the designer of a game, you could load up your board game rules with like, oh, and by the way, the best way to win a game of Risk is to get into Australia and, you know, hunker down there and you'll win the game. But that's not what you're teaching them. You're not teaching them the, the joy in a game is learning how to win it yourself. You're learning, you're trying to teach them how to play the game. And similarly with documentation, I feel like, um, you know, your goal is not to, um, you know, you want to teach the people, your readers, like how to, how to accomplish the things that they're doing. Um, I think too often when we, we approach documentation where we have in our head how things are, should be done. And, um, you know, you just want to like, maybe just write them a procedural. It's like, listen, I know how to do this, just do this and this and this and this, and then you're done. But really it's, you know, you want to, you know, teach the people the fish, as they say in the old expression. And I think the same is true with uh, board game rules. Okay. 
just, I mean, we've got so many questions, so I'm trying to <laughs> like process them all. But um, I think I, I'll also read some feedback that we got. Um, Amanda over here in LA mentioned that uh, she writes internal documentation for artists and gamers. So she mentioned uh, really loving your talk because of all the attention that you paid to the visual side of the documentation to, to the board game roles. And I also appreciate that. Um, Sean had an early question about, uh, do you have an opinion uh, in regards to adding video tutorials to game rule books like on YouTube? Yeah, it's pretty common these days to, um, they're not, the, the videos are not integrated into the rules, but the rules will include a link to a how-to video out there. Again, it comes back to people learn through different channels. Some people learn through um, listening, some people learn from reading, some people learn from doing. Uh, you know, listening that is covered by um, uh, watching a video. Um, and also the other thing about it is, like me personally, even even if I'm the guy that's going to learn the rules and then teach it to the group, I will read the rules and then I'll watch somebody else explain it to me. Uh, because very often, I think I have a pretty good grasp of the rules, but then I watch somebody else explain it and they'll mention something that I've overlooked or maybe some aspect of the game that's unclear. Uh, that, you know, they'll be able to explain it. Um, if people are interested in board games, you're probably already aware of this guy, Rodney Smith. He, he hosts a show called Watch It Played. That's all he does. He explains board game rules for people, either in place of reading the book yourself or as a supplement for uh, reading the book yourself. Uh, and I think that our industry could probably learn from the example that he sets. Um, reading the rules and watching the video on uh, the rules are two different ways of learning. And you can do one or the other, or you can do them in, in tandem. Yeah, this is, uh, I guess this is a thread of conversation I wasn't expecting to have in this context, but it makes total sense. I mean, I, I don't play a lot of board games myself. I don't play a lot of video games, but I mean, when we think about how popular Twitch streams are and, uh, you know, all these other, uh, I guess, video game related channels there are, um, I guess that speaks to the fact that documentation, especially in this context, is living. And I, I think like you'd pointed out in your presentation, it exists in the minds of the people who are playing it. So it's, it's all very exciting, I think. Um, looking at my other screen to, to find some other questions. Um, Kathy has asked if you have any suggestions for um, breaking up the text of uh, instructions with the visuals when you don't have graphic design skills or access to a colleague who does. Um. Well, you know, there's there's screenshots you can use as well. Even just screenshots with, uh, uh, you know, circles around key things or arrows that are pointing out to, to key things. I mean, even that's enough to, uh, that's that's enough of a visual to sort of arrest somebody's attention and to uh, illustrate some key things that you're doing. Most, of, you know, board games, as a matter of course, have beautiful art. The Wingspan, which I talked about in depth, has amazing art. But when you look inside the rule books themselves, usually what you're looking at as far as art goes is just an illustration of a card that already exists in the game or uh, a picture of the board. You know, they're not freehanding new art. They're just illustrating the art that's already there and cueing the eye towards the key things that people need to, to zero in on. Okay, cool. Just glancing again at my document with the questions in it. Um, Juan had a question. Um, I guess since your presentation talked so much about the parallels between uh, so-called conventional uh, technical documentation and board game docs, mm -hmm. um, can you think of an example of um, a practice in board games that would not translate very well to technical docs? Yeah, actually, I had one in there that I, uh, I then I took out because I was like, why, why talk about the things that don't work? But at some one point in the presentation, I talked about board games using more icons to illustrate key points. I think I use Terraforming Mars as an example of where uh, every card has what are called tags on them. Uh, and then you can use those sort of quick reference for tags. Um, in board games, they can go to the extreme. I have another game. One of, it's actually a great game. It's one of the most uh, celebrated games called Race for the Galaxy. Uh, but the people who designed this game went this route, I think mostly for localization, of making every single action possible in the game an icon and then it comes with this in the back of the rule book there's like i don't know maybe a score maybe two score of icons and then a cheat sheet with all these icons 
that's the sort of thing that in technical documentation you just cannot uh, translate. I mean, we, we do rely on words. <laughs> um, I'm sure the, the globalization costs of that were a fraction of what they would have been otherwise. But at some point, you know, we are writers and we have to rely on our words to communicate things. That's something that a, a board game uh, might be able to get away with that we cannot. <laughs> okay, interesting. Um, I, I guess you've also just reminded me too of like all the, all the, I guess all of the best practices that we continue to hear about um, in documentation that isn't necessarily specific to board games, but that you reiterated a lot, which uh, I guess include the fact that people learn by doing, um, you want to make sure that you're using very specific language. Hexagons are not squares. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you want to use pictures when possible. You want to take advantage of the feedback and the data that you get. No. Um, this is, yeah, it's just all really exciting to hear. Um, I'm going to glance at the chat in our session just to see uh, some of the questions that we might have gotten more recently. Um, and if we scroll back a little bit, we've got something from Liz. Um, Liz is saying this this isn't necessarily about the manuals themselves, but that uh, games on Kickstarter have to essentially pull off a full description of what to do oh, without having the physical pieces in front of them. So do you find that there's a difference between writing for a Kickstarter page versus user manuals? Uh, yeah, I, I self-banned myself from Kickstarter. I won't, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I kickstarted too many games that never showed up and weren't that good. So I basically, I'm entering like year five of a self-imposed exile from Kickstarter. Do not, do not have a lot of knowledge about that, to be honest. <laughs> okay, that's its own world. I had no idea. <laughs> um, I'm still reading the rest of her question here. She's got another one. Uh, or an add-on question about, well, we don't have to be specific to Kickstarter, but um, what are the parallels that you see between marketing and documentation here? You know, one of the things we, we do at Microsoft is we try to have a pretty clear delineation between our marketing site and our technical documentation site. And it's not so much because, you know, we're different orgs or whatever, but, uh, you know, one of the things I mentioned in the talk is you want to call things what they are. And marketers have terms for things. They like to rebrand things all the time. They like to call things by some, you know, instead of it being, uh, you know, encryption, it's got to be uh, some fancy name for it. So uh, we try to drive along mostly just for the sake of clarity. If people want to read, you know, the specs for something or they want to read the value prop, we'll give them a sentence or two of value prop, but we give them elsewhere where they can look for that. Uh, and we, I, we think that does a service to them. Uh, because again, it comes down to the audience, the people that are coming to the technical documentation, presumably they've already sold on the product or some decision maker in their org has already bought the product. Uh, so we're just gonna, you know, just the facts. <laughs> okay, okay. I, th I think we may be running out of time. Um, maybe I can pull one more question from, huh, we are over time. Um, okay. We are over time. Let's okay. It's uh, let, let's think about this here. Uh, Matthew, Matt, it's up to you if you'd like to stay on camera. Um, I think we can keep getting questions in over the chat. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. And I think we're at our lunch break then. So, I mean, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for being here.